Hello, everybody. My name is Alistair Roth. I'm the Executive Director of AWI Victoria, and welcome to our webinar. We've had huge interest for this. We've had about 250 people registered, so it's fantastic to see so much interest out there, and we really appreciate your support while we're in lockdown. I'll just say a brief, few brief words on the running order before I introduce the session. The talk will run for about half an hour, and we'll then take Q&A session after that and get through as many questions as we can. You can type your questions in the Q&A tab in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you keep them a little brief, it makes our life easier. Um, you can also vote on questions posed by other people, and we'll be sending out a recording of the talk after it's all done. So to today's topic, Asia after the pandemic. Well, you might think that a public health crisis would encourage nations to set aside their differences and work together for the greater good. But the COVID pandemic seems just to have accentuated national differences and ratcheted up regional rivalries. To talk about what this means for Australia and for the world and the impact on emerging patterns of great power rivalry, we're joined by Professor Nick Bisley. Nick is the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor of International Relations at La Trobe University. He is a member of the advisory board of China Matters. He's on the Council for Security and Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. And fairly recently, he finished up his tenure as editor in chief of the Australian Journal of International Affairs. Our flagship publication, and one of the benefits of being a member of the Institute. Nick, it's great to have you with us. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll now hand across to you. Thanks, Alistair. Um, it's good to see the product placement is always uh, core business for AIIA. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to, to be here uh, or be with you all virtually. Um, ordinarily, uh, giving a talk to AIIA Vic uh, involves going to the very atmospheric Dyson house. Um, and the way I usually approach it is through a a walk through the, the MCG gardens. So it's um, slightly sad not to be doing that in, in what is a, a very typically Melbourne um, autumnal evening where it's gray, it looks like it might rain and the weather's fairly grim, but it's, it's quite atmospheric. So it's, a, it's with a touch of um, uh, sadness that that's not the case, but it's glad, I'm very glad for the opportunity um, to speak, which is also an opportunity for me to try to clarify some of my thoughts about um, what the region may look like after the pandemic. And it's probably good to start with a degree of uh, humility, I guess, when you're looking forward and trying to speculate about what's going to come um, from a, you know, you're asking to get egg on your face. Uh, so all of that's got to be, you know, before we start, really put put um, put that out there, that this is thinking about a world that is, is yet to be formed. We don't know how it's going to play. There's an, an infinite variety of ways in which the variables could unfold. Um, but I think, I, I, as, as you'll gather by my thoughts, um, I think there's some clear uh, patterns emerging, and I think we've got we do have something to grab a hold of to get a sense of what the world's going to look like when all of this is over. Um, as Alistair said at the top, uh, we might have thought that uh, a crisis like COVID nineteen, which was a, a, at its core, is of a, a deeply human catastrophe, both about the lives lost and then the social consequences caused by the economic uh, catastrophe that has had to be unleashed to uh, combat the disease, that some of the trends that were in play in the region uh, may have uh, been halted. In particular, you know, if we think about what Asia was like before the pandemic, uh, it was only a few months ago, but it feels like another lifetime ago, uh, what we had in place was Growing great, cow, great, sorry, growing great power competition in place, and particularly, you know, a, a People's Republic of China that had become much more assertive uh, and confident about its place in the world. And in many respects, I think pretty clearly aiming to become uh, a dominant power, if not the dominant power uh, in Asia. Uh, of course, the way in which it frames it and has talked about its place in the world has always been coy, but you saw over the past few years and really post um, the 2017 uh, 19th Party Congress, uh, a China that was unabashedly moving away from its bide your time, hide its claws, 
keep a low profile approach that had really been the hallmark for how China had comported itself uh, really from the post, post Mao period. So you saw an ambitious, assertive and confident China with uh, clear regional ambitions and then the United States that made clear, at least in rhetorical terms, um, if not necessarily in everything that it did, that it intended to see off this challenge. Uh, and it's the Trump administration made very clear that in its national security strategy of 2017, uh, that it saw great power competition as at the center of American international policy uh, and that the confrontation with China was really gonna be at the heart of American global strategy. Uh, so that competition that was in place, we might have thought uh, could have been short circuited by the human catastrophe of the catastrophe of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, there's an uh, interesting sort of parallel to some, well, not really a parallel, but um, when Ronald Reagan was president and when particularly when he was at the height of his concerns about nuclear weapons, and, and it's, it's often forgotten that Reagan had, despite the fact he has a bit of a reputation as a, a Cold War hawk and a spend, spend the Soviets to death approach through, through military expenditure, um, that he was deeply, deeply uneasy about nuclear weapons, profoundly shocked uh, by the kind of power that he himself wielded and would tell anyone who cared to listen at, at any opportunity that what the world needed, this is from Reagan's point of view, uh, was an alien invasion because that sort of external shock would, would be the prompt that got the nations of the world to put aside their differences and work together to see off the common foe. So you might have thought, that that kind of long-term trend of great power competition in Asia in which war between China and the United States was becoming not likely but more likely than it had been in the past might have been short-circuited uh, but as as I was saying at the top uh, or as Alice was saying rather um, it's pretty clear that that is not what's going to happen um, so what will change in Asia because of the pandemic um, what I want to do in my comments is, is really focus on three or four main things that I think are going to be the, the principal uh, components of a post-pandemic uh, Asia, and particularly focus on areas where there's either clear points of change or areas in which there's continuity but sort of accentuation of existing patterns of relations, uh, and then try to say a few things about what this means more generally for how the region is going to operate and for uh, and so a few things at the end about what this means for a country like uh, Australia. And then hopefully if I'm um, disciplined with my time, that'll give us plenty of uh, time for Q&A. Alistair did say to go for to half past, so keep focused. And certainly we know from um, at my university, we're all fully online and the feedback the students give us unequivocally is don't talk on Zoom for too long. They want to interact. Um, so what will change? I think the most obvious stuff, uh, sorry, the most obvious domain in which we're going to see significant change from what had come before uh, is in the economic uh, dimensions. Uh, and and it, it is worth thinking about what Asia looked like again from an economic point of view before the pandemic. Um, Asia was becoming steadily over a long period of time more economically integrated. Um, it was uh, an economy, or if you think of it as a, as a regional economy that was increasingly trading and investing in one another. It was still in a very dynamic growth phase, although the dynamism was petering out uh, to some degree. You know, the Chinese economic growth rate has always been a, a thing of some much speculation, suspicions that the GDP figures that the, the, the Beijing produces are not fully accurate. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it, it, even with a sort of more pessimistic take, China was still in, in you know, four decades of uninterrupted economic growth, a very significant kind. Um, and more importantly, that economic integration with the region was one that was in which, which was strengthening China's hand by um, year by year. And we were seeing the beginnings of a, of a China-centered economic order. Uh, and with the Belt and Road Initiative that China's been uh, increasingly pushing in recent years as, as its sort of main uh, organizational principle for international policy, you saw something of a kind of infrastructure pardon the pun because it's an infrastructure program, but, but the infrastructure of a China-centered um, regional economy. Some people have described BRI as, as kind of glo uh, globalization with Chinese characteristics or, or more precisely an attempt by China to export to some degree aspects of its developmental model around its periphery in the first instance, but more, more, more generally about improving its um, network and connectivity to the rest of the world. So how is, how is that all going to change? Um, well, I think, as you probably gathered by me flagging in this way, 
Uh, deglobalization is probably one of the things we're going to see play out to some degree and a return of or a kind of ramped up mercantilism. Uh, so really up until um, the early months of this year, globalization, one form or another, uh, has, we've known for a long time, has been something that, yes, gen that, that generates considerable economic efficiency and considerable economic um, prosperity, although it does it in very uneven ways, um, but in the aggregate, it makes people much better off. But what it brings with it is a very significant ramping up of vulnerabilities. So the more plugged in you are to the rest of the world, the more vulnerable you are in, in a very diverse set of ways to a set of risks and challenges because of those points of connectivity. Um, you have a, a, a bigger, broader, softer underbelly, if you like, for risks, and whether those are around risks to do with financial crises, whether they're risks to do with um, supply chains being interrupted, or whether they're risks to do with the spread of infectious disease or some combination of all of those. But on balance, we know we, we saw very clearly that states were aware of those vulnerabilities, um, but were prepared to live with them. Sometimes they would curtail and think about the response to September 11th and the terrorism uh, attacks of, of, of that day, where you saw some curtailing of globalization and movement of populations to try to um, see off or, or construct contain or challenge. Um, Matt, can I just jump in a second? We, we've had a bit of feedback that some people are uh, having problems with the volume. I don't know if you can speak up or get a... Speak up. I'll get closer to my microphone. Okay, yeah. and I'll... There's nothing we can control our end, but that Okay, be... I'll, get, I'll get closer. I just don't... I just... I'm the I don't... Of this online world. We're all getting to grips. But sorry to interrupt, but... That's okay. No, no. I'm... Thank it, you. It's good to know. Um, I just didn't want my, my face to be too large to my screen. Um, so... So we've known that states have known about the vulnerabilities of globalization, but on balance have, have accepted those risks in return for the efficiencies and wealth and prosperity that it has created. It is very clear that that level of risk appetite, if you like, is not going to remain uh, the same. What we don't know, of course, is the extent to which states are going to dial that back and how much that's going to occur. I think some kind of deglobalization is going to occur. Um, and at, at one end of the spectrum, you see people who, who've argued for a long while, um, like arguing largely in the wilderness, about the need to have self-sufficiency in certain areas, the need to be able to, um, and with what, what COVID has made very clear, you know, the need to have a domestic pharmaceutical capacity, a need to have um, the ability to, to, to manufacture um, uh, personal protective equipment and all of the things that, that we've seen uh, in short supply as a consequence of, of the crisis. Um, but it could, it could get more, much more broad based than that. You know, we could see in a whole range of sectors um, the desire to revert to the national. Uh, so that kind of imperative for some kind of self-sufficiency is going to play itself out. And again, we don't know how much. Um, and I'll come back at the end just to say a little bit about on a more glass half full version, that this may not happen, you know, that there are, there, whilst there could be a lot of chatter now about that, it may recede. But I think for the purposes of just thinking through what all this means, if we had an increasingly globalised Asia before, there's a very strong set of probabilities that in Asia is going to be less well economically connected than it was in the past. Uh, and you know, at a basic level, if you think about what economies are doing in response to the crisis, um, they are you know, they're spending like crazy, they're stacking up national balance sheets. One suspects there's going to be, um, as the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 did, you're going to see states as having much bigger stake in their domestic economies, as in owning industries, sectors, airlines, manufacturers, or whomever else. And then on top of it, you've got um, a nationalist component around economic redevelopment. Uh, and we've seen in Australia, the, the truly surprising, genuinely surprising, articulation of a very national sentiment around immigration and jobs coming from the Labour Party, a party which has generally been associated with a more uh, open approach to, to immigration, essentially saying, you know, we, we think less immigration is good, Australians should get jobs, whatever jobs there are in the first instance. Um, so if you had, if, if, if to mention one's deglobalization, a second and related phenomenon I think is going to be part of the post-COVID world is the, the trend around decoupling and in particular the effort that many had been pressing uh, prior to uh, the pandemic to decouple or disconnect uh, the economies of the United States and China. And you saw that uh, coming, you know, in the first instance around high tech and Huawei and 5G technology, 
but increasingly seeing com both companies and uh, and advocates in the West West Wing and elsewhere saying the United States shouldn't be so economically dependent on China, and it should, whether it, in its Trump this diversion have manufacturing back in Wisconsin and Michigan and, and the Rust Belt states, or whether it just meant that we we sh you know we shouldn't be so dependent on everything being put together in China and should instead encourage what was already beginning to happen, where you saw low cost manufacturers beginning to move out of China as labor costs went up and moving into places like Vietnam and elsewhere, saying, you know, we should really encourage that. Um, and, and it is important to remember that whilst we in the West tend to focus on the Trump administration in particular being an advocate for this, there are loud voices in China as well arguing for, for decoupling. Um, so these are the, the, the advocates who basically feel that China is too dependent on the United States, it's too dependent on the West, it is you know, too vulnerable to US you know, having so many treasury bills, for example, and its foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and so if you have on both sides of the Pacific a pressure to, to disconnect uh, these two economies, added to a sense of more broader deglobalization, um, you have the recipe for what I think could be a very highly politicized remaking of um, both Asia's regional economy and potentially the global economy. And then what's going to come with that, I think, is, is probably the thing about which I'm perhaps most confident about where the regional economy is going to go, and that is a kind of low growth environment. Um, it's, and yeah, this is not, not, not particularly contentious, I think that it is very unlikely that we're going to see the kinds of high rates of growth coming out of the region um, uh, that has really been the hallmark for the past 20 years and in the, in the future. So what does all of that mean? I think ultimately what it means is that even in the early months of this year when talk of decoupling was around uh, and the sort of trade wars were, were um, disrupting economic interaction between the US and China, that the two countries still retained a very significant set of economic interdependencies. And what this meant was that the kind of purely strategic kind of geopolitical logic of their interactions had some mitigating forces that, or some kind of ballast that the two were, not, were only gonna go so far in confronting one another because the economic price each would pay for taking the other on too, too spectacularly was gonna to be too high. Um, what the post, COVID world might create is a world in which those economic um, dampeners, if you like, are no longer there. And what we have instead is a region in which the sort of geopolitical and strategic logic of competition is unrestrained. So that's part one. But as I said at the start um, of, of my remarks in this area, I think it's not inevitable that this is the case. And I think whilst when you're scanning the horizon and trying to think about where we're going to go, um, there's a temptation to look and, and find the, the more catastrophic or the more uh, drastic changes. There are a fairly significant set of incentives um, to go back to normal, to go back to where we were before. So that, for example, if you wanted to unpick supply chains, if you wanted to recreate, you know, if you're um, a firm that wants to recreate its production chain on a less China-centric model, then you're going to have to to accept that this is going to cost more, that this will take longer to recreate, um, and that your returns are going to be lower, both in the short, medium, and probably the longer term. Long term is hard to work out. So it may be that in individual firm behavior, and also in, in state behavior, you may see a, um, a, 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 a set of actions in which we revert, in many areas, back to normal. You might see a sort of high-tech decoupling and sort of two separate sets of internets, but you may see in all sorts of other things and consumer durables and other things like that, actually we go back to largely where we were before, in which case I think that um, more dire scenario is, is perhaps mitigated to some degree. Um, what's the second, the second, I think, big change that we're going to see that is perhaps less drastic than the economic, but it's, it's nonetheless worth uh, sort of saying a few things about, and that is um, the real dominance that the domestic and the nationalist is going to play in the politics of, of of Asia, both and it's both the politics literally of you know those societies, but also the politics of how the region's economy functions, and that there was sort of hinting at that in my earlier comments. Um, we've it has been absolutely striking and frankly somewhat depressing that at a time of you know this acute human global catastrophe, how little intergovernmental collaboration has occurred. That in response to this pandemic, states have reverted to the national, and in fact, in many respects, reverted almost to the local, where we've had a 
response to the virus, which has been almost jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and you know, in federal states like Australia and the United States, that's there's a, a governmental structure that almost encourages that. But also the physical nature of the virus and its spread means that you know there is a and, and the way in which we're physically containing it through dis social distancing and, and quarantining um, means that that imperative to sort of go local and and um, go national and go local is, is very very strong um, there has been of course a good level of collaboration amongst research institutions and universities and scientists around uh, combating the disease but it's it is really remarkable how um, how poor the collaborative the international collaborative effort has been to date uh, and then think also about the politics of the crisis the fact that all the way through the crisis even if its darkest days, assuming we've seen the back of them uh, in the United States and elsewhere, it was a politics of finger pointing, blame shifting uh, and demonizing each other and particularly around China and the United States. Uh, so that, you know, when you think about how states are going to position themselves, if you're doing this in the middle of the crisis, you know what's going to happen when we, when we come out of it. And of course, as I was intimating, the inward focus that is going to dominate um, the post-COVID economic reconstruction um, is going to really accentuate this. You know, we, we are in, you know, certainly in the Australian context, we're in the worst economic state we've been probably since the depression. Certainly this is the biggest thing that's happened to the Australian economy since the Second World War. Um, we are going to be, you know, digging ourselves out of this hole for a while. And we in Australia have done fairly well compared to how the rest of the world is, is, is traveling. So, and, and then on top of that, again, to, to view from an international level, um, I think Asia already had a fairly weak set of institutions that already were fairly subordinate to the, na to, to the national interests of, of their members. And that is only going to continue, if not be further exacerbated. That's to say where states feel um, that these institutions provide a constraint on their either domestic autonomy or they're adva uh, advancing their national interests. When those national interests are thought about in very nationalistic terms, um, these institutions are going to become either completely irrelevant or, or just simply further um, undermined or, or, or um, diluted in their influence. Um, and of course, nationalism uh, was already a fairly significant pl um, player in regional politics anyway, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in India, whether it's in China, or of course in the United States, in all of these places, a kind of wounded, defensive, backward looking nationalism um, of self aggrandizement is, um, has, has been played to domestic political effect and is a big part of the sort of domestic narrative of the dominant players. So what does this mean for kind of power and strategy in the region? Um, a few a few headline um, points to draw your attention to before I get to say a few things about Australia, and then I'll shut up. Um, is well, first I think um, the economic consequences of the pandemic, I think, are going to significantly well, not not significantly, will further constrain America's capacity to to uh, be the sort of primary or dominant power, militarily speaking, in Asia. I think already we've come to realize through you know, very great studies um, by you know, colleagues and friends at the US Study Center in Sydney that have shown in great detail that American military primacy in Asia ain't what it used to be. Uh, there's a, a, a David Ignatius uh, wrote an interesting review of um, a book who's just whose title has just gone out of my head, um, which provides further detail on all of this. But the, the scale of the economic hole in the US economy is going to be in will mean that, this, that, that those long term factors that have led to the erosion of American military primacy in Asia are going to continue. And the economic capacity of the US to fund a great long term great power competition for influence in Asia, I think, is going to be significantly weakened or ex that the weaknesses that were already in train are going to be accelerated by, uh, by the pandemic. For its, um, when we look at Beijing, I think it, it will probably not be as badly constrained, but to think that China, China's gonna sail out of this with, with um, a few bruises is probably wrong as well. Again, we don't know as much about what the Chinese economic, uh, uh, sorry, what the Chinese economy is doing, what the economic consequences for the PLC are in the most immediate term, but sort of people who watch that, that economy closely know that something very significant happened for a few months uh, and that uh, China is going to you know, suffer for it in the longer run. But I think 
In terms of how that will influence China's uh, strategic autonomy or strategic operations in Asia, I think it will be <clears throat> less constrained than the United States. And partly that's just because of the geographic advantage that China has um, that, that the US has to overcome. You know, it is a resident power in Asia. Uh, the cost of it projecting that influence and being preeminent given its geography and its set of interests, the, the price of doing business, so to speak, is lower for them so that the, the economic constraint is, is less. Um, I think Belt and Road Initiative, which has been a, a, at the centerpiece of its international policy for, for some years now, is probably also going to take a bit of a hammering. Um, if, you know, if there's an economic price to pay for COVID, uh, I think uh, China's ability, it, it's, some of it will be visible in BRI, and you'll probably see some pairing back of some of the more ambitious aspects of that as you know, the, the kind of the surplus capital that was being exported globally through BRIs may well be needed at home. Um, but it's not going to call, bring it to a halt. So you, what you see, I think, is this sort of pairing back of ambition, the scaling back of certain kinds of projects, already, you know, which is already um, in play as Beijing is beginning to become more sensitive to the criticisms around BRI. Uh, I think one thing that's interesting, and, and it is really too early to tell, is what impact the pandemic will have on, on the two other aspirant great powers in the region, that's India and Indonesia. Um, is COVID going to be something that really hobbles these two countries in the first instance as public health disasters and then in the second instance as, as economic catastrophes? We just don't know um, at this stage because both of those are in very much in their early stages and we don't know the extent to which uh, those economies will be able to recover. Because on, on one hand, there's a sort of version that says this will be a bump in the road and those two countries are on there on a long-term trajectory to be Asia's sort of number two, number three, number four economies, depending on how you slice them. Um, or there's a version that says, actually, this is it. You know, th th these countries had a, a demographic window of the next 25 years to become... Uh, you know, really dynamic economies to have capacity at a at a level at which you'd expect their demography and their ambition, and that COVID is going to be the thing that says that's that window is now closed. We simply don't know, but I think we one thing we can say with confidence is that their economies will slow down, that there will be lower growth, and there'll be lower growth potential for both of them because of deglobalization. And I think that's an important thing to sort of think through. Um, finally. A strategy in the region of great power competition is going to be shaped not just by the material capacities of these countries, like who's got what, what, what wealth and who's got what weapons and, uh, and aircraft carriers and submarines and jet fighters, but what is their political will? What's their confidence? Um, and what's their capacity to exert influence understood not as simply how many boats have they got, but their sense of being able to craft a strategic vision and apply it and do it do so consistently and effectively and i think on both sides what we'll see um sorry on all sides what we'll see is that the kind of will and competence and capacity to do strategy in the region to compete um will be weakened uh and on that front so i think the weakness is going to occur across the board but the relative effect of that will be much more significant for the united states which was already struggling internally with a sense of how do we you know, reconcile a liberal elite's instincts to continue to play a global role and a, a domestic electorate that is much more ambivalent about that? And that's, you know, to some degree, goes some of the way to explaining Trump not, I mean, in, in its entirety. Uh, but COVID and its consequences will make doing the business of being a great power in Asia and on the global stage that much harder because of the way in which it's going to sap that capacity to see and understand and articulate a, a sense of purpose in the region. So, so to finish, um, I don't think there's going to be a fundamental shift in the trajectory Asia was on, um, but it's been, but we're going to see a significant acceleration of certain trends that were in play. Great power rivalry was, was already uh, out of the blocks, it's, and it's just going to accelerate and there's the risk, as I was sketching out earlier, with that deglobalization, with decoupling, with economic nationalism, that great power rivalry can have a sort of politically unrestrained dominance of the region. So that's the region that doesn't have those cross-cutting stabilizing forces of economic interdependence. Um, that the nationalism that was already in train in the region is going to further be enhanced 
um, this, whether it's a, a, an overtly xenophobic nationalism or whether it's just a nationalism of focusing inwards on, on one's own patch, but it's going to be there and play a bigger role. Uh, the region's economy is going to be slower and it'll be less well integrated in the past. Although I said, as I said, there's a scope for just how um, deglobalized Asia becomes. And of course, the institutions that have been set up to try to promote cooperation, to try to promote integration, to try to promote a sense of common cause will be further weakened. What this means for Australia, of course, is a much more complex world in which second tier powers have to try to chart their, uh, navigate their, their, their path. Um, it was already difficult, um, given that we are, have a strong set of economic interests with China and a strategic set of relations, an important strategic relationship with the United States. Um, but I think for a country like Australia, and one thing I haven't mentioned, partly because of time, is you know, as a liberal country uh, with a strong interest in the rule of law, multilateral institutions, uh, and liberal values, that context of great power rivalry, weakening liberal um, states, and our major security guarantor, I think having some serious questions about its long-term durability as a, as a major player in the region, I think this presents the country with um, what was all, you know, what we had was already a difficult set of circumstances. Uh, the pandemic, I think, very plainly says that we're now facing a sort of historical shift in our international environment and we need to think quite hard about how we approach things because the current way in which uh, government, and this is governments of both stripes, had seen the region and thought about where the direction it was going down was one in which a few tweaks with the basic settings we've been uh, that have been sort of guiding Australian policy over the past two, two to three decades. A few tweaks was all we needed because, you know, the US was here, going to stay. China had all these question marks around it. Um, institutions, it could be bound to the liberal order. It was all going to be largely, you know, okay, a few, bit, a few changes here and there, spend a bit more on defence as a sort of risk mitigation strategy. I think all of that needs to be fundamentally rethought. Um, that looked like that was going to be necessary anyway. I think COVID has simply accentuated this and accelerated it. All right, I'll stop there. Um, two minutes over time, but uh, hopefully you have plenty of um, time for Q&A. Yeah. Alistair, time to conduct that's, the audience. That's, that's perfect. Uh, very, very timely finishing. Thank you very much. And yes, plenty of questions and we'll, we'll get through uh, as many as we can. Um, the, the most uh, voted on, which I've just lost, yeah. Um, okay, with with the increasingly fraught relations with China at the moment, should Australia be using the opportunity to strengthen its relationships with other regional powers? Well, notably Indonesia, and I guess th there's a question too about India. Um, so perhaps you could comment a little bit more on both Indonesia and the relationship with India. Yeah, I think. Look, I think the answer to that, I mean, is a sort of is a yes but so it's a yes in the sense that i think we, we absolutely do um a, 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 and that's also been i mean that's been the case for some time but i think um it's it's not just a question that where the but comes in is it's not just a question of that we ought to strengthen our relations we need to think through what we need and want in the region and think about how those relationships with those key power key, key powers is going to advance that and i think the the thing that i you know, it's an ambitious call, but I think that the, the thing that Australia hasn't done is thought and, and, and really needs to do this in collaboration with a range of countries across the region is to think, okay, what does, what does a region in which great power rivalry is playing such a dominant role look like in which we can, all of us who don't really want to be part of this, can play a role in either reducing the effects of that rivalry, seeing it off or managing it? So what that means, I guess, is saying, how do we exercise a leadership collectively with a group of states whose interests don't align, um, who have quite different value systems, quite very diverse cultures, um, but all of whom can probably agree on one basic thing, which is we don't want US-China rivalry to dominate our futures. And that's the thinking um, that I think hasn't begun to really be done either in Canberra or elsewhere, because really we felt that US primacy is here to stay either China would kind of accept it or the US would see off the China challenge. And I think both of those assumptions, I think, should be, should now put those to, to, to bed. In, in terms of uh, what's been described as uh, megaphone diplomacy with China, 
relating particularly to the the inquiry about um, COVID, do you think that's been productive or counterproductive? Um, uh, yeah, counterproductive. Um, uh, ask a barley farmer in Western Australia what they think about it, and I'll tell you. Um, no, it, it was sta a staggering incompetence of, of, a, of a diplomacy. It doesn't pass Diplomacy 101. Um, Australia going out and saying there should be an independent inquiry um, into what had occurred. There absolutely should be an independent inquiry. We need to know what the heck happened and how we can ensure that this does not happen again. The world cannot afford another one of these. And I mean that quite literally. Um, but if you're Australia, you, there is nothing to be gained by going out there on your own and doing that. The textbook says what you do is you find other like-minded countries, and I mean like-minded by this, not democratics, but countries who just want to get to the bottom of this as a public health issue, and you form a multinational coalition, preferably broad spectrum, not just a bunch of American allies. You use a multilateral institution as your platform, and you get a sufficiently large chorus that not even China can thumb its nose at. And that's where we got to, eventually, by the looks of it, in terms of you know China's accepting accepting some kind of WHO oversight with some caveats and so on and so forth, but the price that Australia has paid for you know frankly amateur hour diplomacy will be very considerable to no great benefit apart from the shrieking chorus of of those who say Australia done it we showed them you know sorry the little chest the little, the, the, the moment the, the minor period of chest beating is going to cost this economy an enormous amount of money at a time precisely when we cannot afford it. In, in terms of other um, middle power com countries stepping up, maybe, do, do you see any others taking on active leadership roles in, in post-COVID? And uh, do you see an organisation like ASEAN having a role to play, or is that going to end up weakened through COVID? Uh, I, I think all the institutions in Asia and, you know, frankly, I think globally institutions are not, not kind of going to come out of this crisis um, with, they will not have had a good virus, if you want to put it that, in those terms. Um, and I have very little confidence that, that ASEAN is, can play the kind of, that sort of leadership, a, a sort of new kind of leadership role, because it's not what it's for, and it's not how it operates, and it's not um, kind of, uh, you know, it's not in its DNA to do things like that. Um, who can provide, who can or ought to provide, so who can or is likely to provide leadership? Um, it's a really interesting question because the, the, the countries that have been most adept um, in the past at doing this are all in sort of funny spots in terms of their leadership. So in the past, you might have said, okay, Indonesia, because of its scale, its influence, and a whole range of other things, it's been, in the past, it's shown real leadership and capacity, you know, in the formation of ASEAN in the 1980s and elsewhere. Um, but Jacobi is, is really not proven to be a particularly effective foreign policy player. Uh, Modi has the ambition, um, although India doesn't have the capacity at the moment in terms of its diplomacy, but it, it may come out of this. Um, although I think Modi's instincts are so domestically focused and so nationalistic that it's difficult to see um, that kind of collaborative leadership and being able to pull people together in a way that's going to be effective. Um, Vietnam's an interesting one, you know, you know, if you think of the, the most important Southeast Asian countries over the next 25 years are, are going to be, in terms of how the region plays out, it's Indonesia, the Philippines and Vietnam, all three of those are in very different spots. Um, but, it, and again, in the way in Vietnam's uh, political leadership plays is it's, it's not a big visible out in front charismatic sort of international leadership, but I think could be, could, has been and, and will be quite an effective, quite backroom. Uh, diplomatic player, uh, and it's also got that the benefit of you know not being an American ally, not being a democracy, and it's important to, that that if you're trying to build cross-cutting coalitions in the region, uh, that it's not just the democracies versus others, and it's not just the American allies versus everyone else. But, but yeah, you know, international leadership is in short supply. Uh, the, the virus has made that very clear. Uh, so I think the short term it's difficult to see. I think in the long term. Those that are the, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, India, they're the countries you'd look to because they've got the scale and capacity to, to provide the leadership. Short term, maybe not. You, you talked about um, well, de deglobalization and, and decoupling. There's a question, do you think that RCEP will be signed and implemented by all the participant countries? Ah, <laughs> um, good question. It's, 
probably, probably uh, only because it's a relatively low bar trade agreement um, in which there's lots of carve-outs, lots of ways of, of um, you know, protecting your own. Uh, but equally, if you're a country that had second thoughts about RCEP, now's a good, you know, you've got a good opportunity to pull the ripcord um, and, and, and drop out of it. But I think on balance, it's, I, I would, you know, not, not a betting person, but I think on balance, it'd be likely to, to get up. I'd be surprised if it didn't, but frankly, I've been surprised by a whole lot in the past couple of months. So it's, it's, um, it's difficult to make these kinds of predictions. But like I said, I think because it's a, an agreement that is relatively low bar, that has relatively low upfront expenses and can, you know, you don't, it's, it's not a super expensive agreement to sign up to. You've got to think that gives a balance of probabilities that it's that it is likely to. And you know, as I was saying before, that the deglobalization is is one possible future. But countries are out there, and they're going to they're desperate to to think about how we're going to reignite growth, how we're going to get trade going, how we're going to get back to to some semblance of of, of prosperity. Uh, and any agreement that is likely to to push things along will be something people will look at closely. So I think those sort of balance of probabilities make me think it's. Uh, uh, it, it's likely to, but um, but happy happy to be corrected by people who are closer to the RCEP coalface than I am. And in, in terms of the impact on the domestic economy, the importance of international students, and obviously coming from China, how do you see that playing out? Uh, this is something that's very close to the bone for, for Australian universities. Um, I, I think that the, the problem that actually, I mean, yes, there's a China problem for international students, um, but there's actually, there's an international student problem. The borders are closed, international travel is so uncertain. Um, no one knows what, how students will respond um, to all of this. You know, if you're someone sitting in India and you were thinking of coming to Australia or Canada or, or anywhere, are you, are you gonna think about going abroad at all anymore? And you know, we, we all like to think that they will. So there's, uh, so, so much has been unsettled. I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, it's a huge problem for Australia. Uh, I, won't, I won't complain about the government's indifference to the fourth biggest export market, but I'll just leave that there. Um, but it is, it is uh, and if, if, if one wants to get slightly reflective on it though, um, for universities, we got ourselves into this pickle, not by design. Um, it's a function of long-term policy settings in which the price of doing business in higher education remorselessly went up, um, government funding remorselessly went down, and equally government didn't deregulate the sector to allow us to raise prices in any way other than from overseas students. Uh, so what that meant was to cover that hole, um, we had to go somewhere, and as a sector, that's what we did. Now, I think we probably... Um, over a long period of time, over, I mean, we clearly over-invested in that. We clearly over, over-egged it. Uh, but equally, no one thought this would happen. No one thought borders would close. No one thought that for a moment um, that we'd have the scale of problem that we did. I think, you know, and, and just to sort of finish the thought, had, had COVID remained a China problem, so if it, if, it, if it had been like SARS, like a big bad SARS, in which, which basically didn't leave, uh, Chinese shores, then we would have had a pretty su serious blow, but it would have been manageable. With all the international students gone, so the students, so it's China first, India second, Vietnam, Latin America, um, Southeast Asia, you know, there's, there's actually a very large spectrum with them all essentially off the table. That's the thing that's really um, damaged the sector profoundly. Um, most universities have lost from 15 to 40 percent of their revenue in this year and probably the same again next year. So it's a, it's a serious, serious problem. It's going to lead to structural change in almost every institution in the country. Um, and as I said, it's what we just don't know is how it will all play out. Um, and it's, but it gets at that larger issue though of globalization. You know, we, we did all know this was a risk um, and we as a sector, I think had long been looking at particularly particularly universities that had were very long on one country. So some institutions in Australia have I mean very high dependence on international students, but have a very high dependence on you know 
international students from China and often those students are from Beijing and Shanghai. You know, it's a really kind of focused dependence. Uh, and there was, there has been long efforts to try to mitigate that risk. But I think it was, it was just trading off one international student for, for, a, for a different country. Um, but I think the, you know, you, you, you've got to think if you're planning out what Australian education future looks like, you'd probably be prudent to assume that uh, the levels of international student enrollment are not going to get back to where they were ever again. Well, coming back to, to geopolitics, I mean, you, you waited an admirably long time before mentioning Mr. Trump's name, but with, with the US and China um, and, and the relativities between them with the pandemic, how do you think Australia should position itself vis-a-vis -vis Australia and China? It's the 64 billion billion oh, US and China, I meant. Yeah, I, I know you were. It's the 64 billion billion RMB question, isn't it? Um, the, you know, the, 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 this, the, the way the Australian government has formulated this or has, has positioned uh, straight up until fairly recently has been, you know, we kind of compartmentalize the two relationships. One's about economics, one's about security, and also about economics. Um, but the two kind of traveled on, on parallel tracks. And so long as the two didn't bump into one another, it was kind of manageable. The past three or four years has, has shown that that way of managing things was ultimately not sustainable because at some point the tracks were going to intersect uh, as the US and China became rivals to one another. I, I honestly don't know what the answer to this is because I think there's sort of three, there are three main options that Australia faces and each has a set of fairly invidious trade-offs and I, to be perfectly fine, vacillate between them uh, and also there, there are varying levels of cost and complexity because, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, three break, the three basic options are, I think, one is we double down on the United States and effectively just say, right, the US is in great power competition with China, so are we, and we join a containing coalition with China, we don't pretend against China, that is, we don't pretend that we all have nice strategic relationships and the partnership that'll go back and win, win, win. We say, no, we, we see you as a challenge to the world order we value. We see you as a threat to our long-term interests and values. Um, and we muscle up with America and other like, you know, quote, unquote, like-minded countries. Um, option two is we distance ourselves from the United States and we not necessarily end our alliance or anything like those like that but we say actually we're, we're uneasy with what you are doing we think this is counterproductive to our interests we think that treating china as enemy number one is not particularly helpful for us or our society given where we are going as a country um, where our region is going uh, and that we need to sort of create more strategic autonomy for ourselves without necessarily pulling the ripcord um, and then the third option, and, and or, or possibly, so within that second option, or possibly even, you know, distancing ourselves so far from the United States that we go down a kind of um, neutrality path or something like that. But, the, but essentially that's a going, it's our version of decoupling with the US. The third one is actually we, we, we stick with the United States to some degree, but actually what we really focus ourselves on is that the, uh, the comment I was saying earlier about working in collaboration with other countries to create, you know, a, not necessarily a middle power coalition, but a vision for the region, um, which is not made in either Beijing or, or Washington, but which ideally, you, you know, take over time, would have a seat at the table for those major powers. Um, and as I said, those three, there's kind of stylized paths. Um, you know, I, I vacillate enormously between, I oscillate enormously between those because I think that each of those has its appeals, each of those has its downsides and each of them um, has very real costs associated with them. Uh, but I think the thing is where we are now is in a muddling along basically the status quo, pretending it's all kind of, you know, a nudge here, a push there, a few more fighter jets, a few more submarines, you know, the fantasy imaginary submarines will never actually come into being, but we're kind of going to pretend we're going to do something about it. Um, that won't do. We'll, we will just, uh, our, our influence and our place in the region will continue to, to decline. What, what about Japan's role 
in the region after this. I don't, I don't know if the shifting of the Olympic Games is, is material or otherwise, but obviously their economy is going into to, to rapid decline again. Where do you see Japan going? I, I think Japan is going to, there's a very, very strong set of possibilities that Japan retreats into its shell as it did through the 90s and early part of the 2000s, the kind of lost decade period in which you have um, a Japan that once again, I mean, it's already got devastating levels of, well, they're not devastating because they don't, it's a curiosity, but they've got very, very high debt to GDP ratios. They're going to go up again. Uh, Abe's ambition for a, China, for a Japan that is muscular, that is playing a, a kind of containing role militarily as well as politically and econ economically against China um, is, is complete fantasy now. I think it was always pretty hard to imagine that that Japan could write much either write much sig more significantly, sorry, much bigger checks for its defence policy and to 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 become the kind of defence force that uh, Abe had ambitions for. That was always pretty hard to imagine in a best case scenario. You look at the future of Japan now and think that's just you know it's it's complete fantasy. So I think I think the what COVID is likely to do is is confirm that Japan is likely as its demography declines to become a division one, second grade, division two power rather, a proper second tier power in the region and not that, you know, it's this curiosity. It's not, clearly not a great power, but it's a big, it's the world's third biggest economy. It's got the, a very significant military. It's a major player in development and all of these things that, that puts it in a funny little category. It's gonna drop down to be, you know, like South Korea, like us, like Canada, you know, in that clear, you know, nice, nice, you know, well done, but you're not a top, top draw player. And that will make, I think the region's geopolitics um, uh, slightly more complex if you're a, if you're like Australia and you want the status quo to remain because Japan is, is a big part of the, you know, if, if you're someone who thinks China can be managed and contained with a balancing coalition, you need a strong Japan. Without a strong Japan, that becomes much, much harder, and particularly if you've got a weakened United States. There's a there's a, a broader question about it, 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 things in a, a state of flux. But do you think the is it is the Bretton Woods system at risk of being derailed, or, or could there be something positive coming out of this in, in reform? Ah, um, it's, it's quaint to think of them as the Bretton Woods institutions because they don't look much like they did <laughs> at the Bretton Woods conference or what came out of it. Um, yeah, I, it's look. It's really early to tell, and it's a little off my 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 core patch, uh, I, I think. But um, you know, it, and much will depend on the, that. The, really, the politics of globalization. So that if if we get really, you know, if we get a return to fifty style industrial policy and skepticism about trade and all of that stuff really takes root. Uh, and national champions, industry policy, the whole bit, then that could be something that really undermines those institutions and takes the kind of political capital and, and momentum away from them. But if if the opposite happens, so let's say if we if we get that desire to re-globalize, a desire to kind of the, the snap back theory of things, um, or at least we we want to try to reconnect things as much as we can. Um, that could provide the kind of wind in the sails for some of the reform around these institutions that they badly needed. So, you know, you get one of the theories of the, of these, of institutional growth is, you know, you need a crisis to really give institutions a, a sufficient clattering that they actually go, yeah, actually, we've got to fix these things. We've got to clean up these things. We've got to change the voting processes. We've got to shift where the power and influence lies. Um, this is, this is such, just such a hammer blow that may do that, but it could be such a blow that it, knocks the whole house over but i'm afraid I'm a little off my patch so i feel like um i, I, I don't want to go too far out of my skis on that one to get to get further further off your patch was a question about what role the eu could be playing globally i mean not possibly not this region particularly but... um, i think the eu would do well to do play a global role in europe Um, in, in, like I said, I don't think no institutions have come out of this particularly um, well. The EU's um, another one amongst them. It's got a serious, it's got serious problems in and, in and amongst its patch. I think it's got ambitions. What, what's perhaps more interesting, I think, and more realistic to think is what role the European powers have in, in a post-COVID Asia, because what we saw in the lead up to it 
uh, was particularly France and Britain, to some extent Germany, but, but much more visibly France and Britain, trying to take a seat at the stage, seeing for themselves as having a role in Asia because they rightly saw Asia's geopolitics and geoeconomics as being at the center of where the world was going and of fundamental importance to their interests because of that. And it wasn't just a, a British post-Brexit, we've got to find a place for ourselves. There's a realization that for, for Britain, uh, I mean, this is, and this is true for the world, as Asia goes, so goes the world um, in, in, a, in economic and political terms. So they want to, they want to, to be part of that. Um, so we saw those countries playing a role. Post-pandemic, will they be back? Will they be competing? Will they be part of that kind of coalition for leadership and, and participation? And, and they may well. I, I simply don't know the extent to which they are. I think one of the things that was I always found very kind of discordant uh, with the British and the French um, diplomacy in Asia was their inability to get out from under the shadow of colonialism and that sense of why he's showing up again and telling us what to do. Uh, and the, the, particularly China, but others who were skeptical of, and for whatever reason wanted to marginalize French or British or other Europeans um, playing a role, could capitalize on that diplomatically and kind of push them to one side. So watching this play out is quite interesting. So they'll need to, if they are going to, to, to play that role, they'll need to front up in a whole range of ways. I mean, militarily, they'll need to be more significantly present. Um, they'll diplomatically need to be much more adept, uh, but they'll also have the politics, they'll have political headwinds that they'll be struggling against because of that, that background. I just want to, we're, we're sort of approaching the, the end of our allotted hour, but I just wanted to ask you on South China Sea. What, what's your perspective on uh, China's activities there while, while people are possibly a bit distracted by what's going on with, with COVID? Are you seeing more, more activity or? Uh, I actually think, I don't think it's more, I think it's um, kind of largely of a piece with what they've been doing. Um, uh, I think it was probably a bit odd to expect that a pattern of behaviour that's long established, because five or six years in it, um, would all of a sudden go on hold because um, the PRC is in lockdown. You know, the PLA is its own, it's almost like its own sovereign entity, if you like. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that, that China was not going to give up the various gambits of, you know, administrative operations, drilling, testing, you know, they, and part of it's the timing, you know, that if you're going to go and do exploratory drilling and testing in South China Sea, you can really only do it this time of year because of the weather and typhoons and things like that. So, so I, I don't, I don't think there was a particular, particularly kind of opportunistic, aha, and everyone's, you know, the virus is here, everyone's eyes somewhere else, let's go. Uh, I think it's, and, and it's in some respects, it's kind of more unsettling because of that, which is to say, China's views about the South China Sea are long run, long held, not going to be, you know, they think, that patch of water is roughly theirs. It's always been a bit ambiguous about exactly what that claim is. Um, but yeah, and, and nothing's gonna stop them from behaving in that way. No virus, none of these sort of stuff. Um, and I think what we saw, if anything, was the response to it, which although Australia was involved and the US was involved, was pretty, um, pretty meek and mild. And if I was sitting in Beijing and looking at how the alignment of interest between those countries um, or misalignment meant that a kind of coordinated response to Beijing was not particularly compelling, you'd think, yeah, we're doing fine. Well, Nick, I think that more or less uh, takes us. There are, there are still questions to go, but as always, we're never going to get through all of them. So I think probably with, with an eye to a clock, we should thank you very much, unless you want to finish up on a, any note of optimism you can find. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you the closing word, and I shall thank you and the audience. But. Uh, note of optimism. Um, well, I guess, no, I, I think there's, there, uh, what I've been saying is very speculative. Um, and I think if we take nothing from the past three months is that history has a knack for surprising us in operating in ways that we had not anticipated. Uh, and we should be sufficiently humble about our foresight to go whilst what I've been sketching out is where I think things are likely to go. Um, things may play very, very differently. Uh, and there's a whole range of possibilities in which um, connectivity improves, in which nationalism is dialed down. I mean, one, op one you know, potentially more positive future is, yes, countries are focused inward, but they're focused inward, which means they're not focusing on you know, fighting each other and getting on with you know, ambitious territorial claims and fights, and they just want to 
get on with the business of domestic economic development. And that may take some, a lot of the, take some of the heat out of these frictions that have been around for a while. So it's not all doom and gloom, but I just, my, you know, inner Hobbesian kind of comes out of these moments and, and, and sees the, um, you know, was it ugly, brutish and short version of where, what our future looks like, which is perhaps, a, you know, you asked me to be pessimistic. Sorry, up to ask you to be optimistic and I finished up a bit grim. Anyway, there it is. Oh, realistic. Okay. Well, Nick, anyway, thank you very much for your time. That was much appreciated. Very interesting. You covered a huge amount of ground. Thank you to everybody watching online. Thank you for your interest. Uh, please stay safe and we'll see you again at another webinar. So from Nick and ourselves, we'll, we'll sign off for today and wish everyone well. Thanks again. Thanks again. Bye.